Hi everyone, I'm Ria Mittal and welcome back to another session of Seller Speak. In today's session, we are going to be talking about ROAS and how you can increase your return on advertising. But before we introduce our guest and we tell you all our secrets on how you can increase your ROAS, let's watch this quick intro. everyone and welcome back to another session of Seller Speak. Today we have Alex Klar with us. Hi Alex. Hi, thank you for having us. Oh yeah, so Alex here is the Head of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships in Payability and Payability uh, is doing like great, great, great business for Amazon sellers and they're here to give you some tips and tricks on ROAS. So before that, let me introduce Alex. Alex is again, as I mentioned, Head of Business Development and Payability. Uh, Alex focuses on connecting marketplaces, solution providers and other industry partners at Payability. He has over 10 years of experience in finance and accounting no wonder he's here to help us with our numbers and Alex is a regular guest speaker to business communities SBM and e-commerce financing uh, events as well so he has founded many businesses and we were just talking about that you were 22 when you founded a business yeah I was um, it was a brick and mortar business it was a, a stone restoration business so I, I grew up in a, in a family business which was carpet restoration and when I uh, you know after I graduated college I decided to start an offshoot of that which was a stone uh, stone and masonry restoration business, which I had oh, for wow. about two to three years and then sold. Wow, like I'm almost 22 and just the thought of starting a business sounds so um, abstract to me right now. Like I can't even think about it. So kudos to you for starting a business, selling it for a profit. And now here he is <laughs> uh, talking to us about ROAS and Payability. So um, Alex, what is Payability and how is Payability helping Amazon sellers right now? Yeah. So Payability is a, it's a fintech company and we provide cash flow and working capital solutions to e-commerce businesses, um, whether they're selling on a marketplace or they're selling on their own website. We have uh, two main products. One is we call instant access, and that's essentially designed for those who are selling on a marketplace and to get you paid faster rather than waiting 14 days, 15 days, 30 days, we get you paid every day. And then we have our instant advance. There it's a lump sum of capital, uh, primarily used for inventory and marketing to be able to grow your business and take advantage of opportunities and new projects that come along. And we've been around for about six years and we've deployed uh, just about three and a half billion dollars in growth capital during that time. Yeah, so I think the first part of it is very important and we'll be getting into it further in the session that's about cash buffer and how Payability can help you in the cash buffering. To begin with, um, I think everyone wants to be profitable on Amazon. And from my experience, I know that it's not easy and it takes some while for you to even start seeing some profit when you start selling on Amazon. So what, according to you, um, makes an Amazon seller more profitable and how, quicker? And how does Payability help in an Amazon seller becoming uh, profitable quicker? Yeah, and uh, it's a great question. And it's one I think that, you know, everyone's always trying to struggle to, to figure out is how do I become more profitable? How do I do it faster? And, you know, one of the, and we don't solve every pain point, unfortunately, but, you know, we do have hundreds of partners like Seller App where, you know, we can recommend for the things that we don't do. But what we tried to, you know, tackle first was one of the biggest pain points, and that is capital. It's very hard to come up with the capital to start a business. It's very hard to be able to have cash flow to be able to take advantage of opportunities. And so, you know, when we're talking about how a, a seller can be profitable quicker, it's, you know, there's a lot to it. So it, it's going to be about, you know, there's a lot of testing of different products. It depends where you are in your journey, too. If, if you're just starting out, yep. you know, we see we see a very common arc with Amazon sellers where it's like, they're just kind of getting into it. Maybe they took a course, maybe they watched a video. Right now during COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of people who had brick and mortar traditional retail stores or ha had you know years and years, maybe even decades of industry experience. They just weren't selling online yet or they were selling online a little bit you know, and now they're starting to double and triple down. So I think when we're talking about where you are in your you know, Amazon journey is kind of the biggest step one. Like, have you ever sold a product before? Is this your first time selling a product? Have you ever sold a product online? And is this your first time? And what we see usually with an Amazon journey is people usually start 
maybe they took a course, maybe they watched a video, maybe they heard from a friend, but they're usually starting in that retail arbitrage or reseller space. Yeah. And we see that a lot because unless you really know how to sell and you know what margins are and you've worked in some type of retail or wholesale capacity, it's very hard to go straight into just creating a product, whether that's a private labeled product or a product you're manufacturing. And I think that's where a lot of people tend to go wrong when they think about e-commerce and they think about being an entrepreneur, they think they need to invent something that's going to be the greatest invention ever. And what happens there is if you have the greatest invention, but you don't know how to sell it, and more importantly, you don't know how to make people find it, then, you know, essentially you're just a great product that's going to sit on the shelf and not move. And what we see with the, the most successful people is they get their, they, they kind of dip their toe in a little bit in that reselling, in that retail arbitrage. And that's where they're learning the tips and tricks of how Amazon actually works. Because as you know, there's so many moving parts to Amazon and it's not yep. even just the cost. It's not even the fees, which I know we're going to get into, but it's how do you even look at a dashboard? How do I, how do I do <laughs> PPC? How do I list my product? How do I make sure that, you know, I have different SKUs? How do I make sure that the labels are put on correctly so I don't get, you know, yep. suspended and, you know, how does FBA work? Should I be using FBA? Should I be packing this up? Yeah. Well, why is Amazon fees so high? Well, why? And so yep. as we learn all these types of things, we want to actually create, you know, less risk for ourselves as we do it. We don't want to buy, we don't want to spend our life savings on buying inventory if we don't know how to sell the inventory yet. And we don't yep. know the how, how the system works. So what we see a lot of successful people do is they started as a reseller. They start doing retail arbitrage. They do some research, whether it's through, um, you know, a lot of products out there or whether it's through mastermind classes, there's tons of, you know, Amazon Facebook groups. And there's a great Amazon community that is, you know, for the most part, willing to share information, whether it's just on the forums or it's in these other groups. And so you learn about, you know, you want to learn at least a handful of products that you think that you can buy low and sell high and use that as your way to kind of learn how Amazon works. And then once you start to get a little bit better, now you're going to start to go into, you know, the problem with just doing retail arbitrage all the time is, is it is beyond a full-time job. You're basically yeah. like a, like a day trader on the stock market because you have to constantly, constantly be replenishing. And there are some people that enjoy doing that because it's fun for them. If we're trying to build a larger sustaining business, unless you can start to build a team, that can actually do all that work all day long, you're gonna be constantly in the buying and selling mode and not getting to actually take the in incremental steps you need to build the business. So usually you start out in retail arbitrage, you start out reselling a couple of products, you learn how the systems work. Then you become a more refined reseller. Now you know which SKUs are working, you know how to play around with advertising, you know, you, you're, you're starting to really understand how the game works and now you're increasing your SKUs. You're probably still reselling, but now you're starting to actually watch your business grow more and more. And then from there, then it's a question of, you know, that's where we sometimes see people now, they usually either become huge resellers and now they have thousands upon thousands of SKUs. They start to have relationships with their vendors and they start to get discounted pricing and start to get maybe products that are uh, exclusive to them but they're not a private label yet. It's still a reselling of someone else. You're still maybe working with a wholesaler or, you know, a vendor that's um, doing a closeout sale, all, all different types of tips and tricks, you know, and like ins and outs, but you're starting to now become more established, which means that you have a little bit more control of like your relationships. And from there, that's usually when we see people start to move into the private label. They have now figured out a product that works. They figured out a category that works. They know the pricing that works for them. They know what their margins are. And now they can start to look to improve upon other things that they've already been reselling. That's like usually one of the tricks is I'm selling speakers, right? I'm selling a Bluetooth speaker and I'm reselling it. I'm not private labeling it yet, but I want to private label it. So how do I do it? Well, a t you know, one way to do it is you start to look at reviews. And you start to really analyze what is everyone complaining about, about this Bluetooth speaker? I'm making good margins. <laughs> I know how much it costs, but where are the complaints? Mm -hmm. Maybe everyone wants one that floats so they can take it into a swimming pool. So that's how yep. you start to then go into private label is you take something that's already working and you improve upon it. Now, that being said, you also have to remember other people are going to do that to you too. And that's why we always have to be constantly, you know, we're either building a brand once we have a private label where people only want to come back to us because they love our brand, 
or we're constantly improving upon products to make sure that other people that might improve upon ours are one step behind us and we're one step ahead. And then from there, you know, whether you're building out the brand, where we see the Arco from usually private label is now I'm building out an established brand. Maybe I have my own website as well. And I'm starting to do advertising off Amazon to try to drive traffic to my own website. And we're seeing really interesting things happening with Amazon right now. Uh, attribution is, is, is now become a thing where you can actually advertise online and drive them back to your same store. We're seeing yeah. really interesting things with Google Shopping, driving to stores. So Amazon's an inc incredible demand engine. And I usually the heart, what we talk about a lot is the hardest thing is keeping up with that demand. But <laughs> you know, you want to harness that demand to build a brand over time. And then ideally you want to be able to sell on multi channels and not just ha have Amazon as one channel. You want to sell on Amazon. You want to sell on your own website. You want to maybe check out other marketplaces like, you know, Walmart eBay. or Newegg or eBay or Top Hatter. And you want to understand how those marketplaces work, what the demand that they're driving is. Each marketplace drives different types of customers. So you want to understand what that demand is, make sure you're priced effectively for it, make sure that you're doing content on your individual page that speaks to that audience. And that's usually the arc we see of people who are just starting out, who then become, you know, very large sellers, like people who start out doing maybe a couple thousand a month, who are now doing a couple hundred thousand a month. It usually has that same arc of, you know, if you've never sold retail before, we see other people who have a retail background, they jump right into it, they have experience, they're now just selling on a different platform. And we see them jump in and they're already selling $100,000, $200,000 a month because it's not new to them, it's just a new channel. So I hope I yeah. answered the question and didn't just uh, talk around it. <laughs> no, that was great, that was great. Like I personally um, had my wheels turning whenever you you know started a new point, so that was great. So um, according to me, how does one become profitable? So uh, do check out Seller App's profit research tool if you haven't, it's free. So once you've done that, you have a product and now you have to make sure that you're able to sell it for at least five times or seven times the price. So that's the rule I have set for the clients that I have. And that's the rule that I want to give out to the people who are selling as well. So if you're not able to sell your products for five times worth the price, you are not going to have enough money to restock your product. And that's going to uh, come back at you. And yeah, and that gets really complicated. So if you want to be profitable, make sure that you're selling your product at the right price. I think that's important as well. What do you think, um, Alex? Well, it's it's a we hadn't talked about this earlier, but I actually have in my notes you want to set a uh, like a ROAS you want to sell you want to set it around six percent. Mm -hmm. So I'm right in between yes. that five and seven because really what we want to do is we want to have enough room to cover the fees. We want to have enough mm -hmm. room to cover the advertising if we're using it, and we want to have enough room to put some money in our pocket as well. Or, or why are we doing this? Yep. Yeah, and for those of you watching right now and you're confused why we're talking about ROAS and not ACOS, because ROAS is standard. So what I have learned from my experience is that ROAS is something that is going to be a standard for all your uh, products, whereas ACOS changes based on your percentage. So Skylar, how does um, one calculate ROAS and how? what's the ideal ROAS according to you? Yeah, so I think when we're talking about ROAS and, and ACOS, you know, what we just mm -hmm. want to understand is it's very simple. ACOS yeah. is the inverse of ROAS. ROAS <laughs> is essentially how much did I make? How much did I spend in advertising? I divide the revenue by the advertising. I come out with a multiple. So let's say that multiple is 3x, right? So mm -hmm. that means that for every dollar I put out, I'm going to get $3 back. That's my return on advertising spend. That's my ROAS. If I want to think about that as ACOS, all I have to do is just do it the other way, right? It's the inverse. I now take that, you know, one, I, I take one divided by three and I have 33%. So it's mm -hmm. really ACOS and ROAS are the same. They're just the inverse. One is a multiple, yep. one is a percentage. And a lot of it yep. is because Amazon likes to have their own unique spin on things and they don't, ROAS is used heavily with Google. Amazon and yep. Google, you know, like Amazon wants to have its own multiple, but they're also doing it because it does make sense for what they're doing, because it's a very effective ACOS that is can be a very effective um, for measuring spend. because it'll show how much of every dollar that was earned with advertising was spent on the ad campaign. So yep. they are the same, though. It's it's literally a multiple yeah. versus a percentage. 
So when we think about ACOS, we think about just ad spend divided by ad revenue times 100, and that's our percentage. Whereas when we're thinking about ROAS, it's ad revenue divided by ad spend. It should work out around the same. And so when we're talking about what ROAS we should be looking for, and, and I use ROAS because, you know, it's the standard outside of Amazon, but again, yep. it's literally the same number. Right? <laughs> so if I say six, if I say a six X ROAS, we're looking for a 16.66% ACOS. That's ACOS, all we have to do. Exactly. One divided by one divided by six, right? So <laughs> yeah. what do you believe? And you know, it's kind of tough. We have to think about different products in different categories as well, because different products and categories and different high ticket items will have different uh, ROAS or different A costs associated with them. So, so as not to confuse everyone, we're going to stick with ROAS. And if yes. I go back and forth <laughs> with ROAS and A costs, I apologize, but we're going to try to stick with ROAS. <laughs> so, yep. we things like consumer electronics, ROAS can be as high as 9X. We've seen ranges that can go as high as, like, we, we've seen products that have ROAS of up to 15X. Now, there's yep. probably not a lot of market saturation there. And we'll get into market saturation, you know, in a little bit and how that works. But, you know, some products have as small as a two and a half, two X ROAS. And so there still might be reasons why you can move a product that has a low ROAS, but it's not going to be sustainable over time. You know, it's more about maybe, maybe you just want to get the brand out there a little bit. Maybe you're willing, you know, maybe there's a lot of noise and you're just trying to break through that noise. So bidding has gone up and you're saying, I just need to be visible. I'm willing to take the loss now to make sure I don't get like lost over time. That's in the future. So, yep. Exactly. But ideally what we're looking for is a base point of around a 6X ROAS. That gives you enough money to be able to handle the costs as well as handle your operations and still have enough money to be able to turn and reinvest back into the business. Uh, we're coming back to that again. So uh, now we're going to talk about Amazon fees and I'm going to prove you how my 5X and 7X model is actually accurate for sellers. So um, let's look at some different types of fees right now. So you have $100 with you, you're uh, giving $30 to uh, your selling price. Then you have $30 to $40 is your Amazon fees, which is quite a lot for some items. Then you have $20 to $30 for your PPC. And then you're left over with $10 or $20 based on your scenario uh, is your leftover amount. And you cannot use this $10 as your leftover amount to restock. Right. And as we know, Amazon here takes buffer period of 15 days, if I'm not wrong, to pay you back. Right. Yes. So um, about four, 14, 15. But actually, and that's something to keep an eye on is we've been seeing and there was just a study done recently, I, I believe, by Marketplace Pulse, that that is actually creeping up to between 20 and 30 days. Uh, Are you serious? And it's mainly because there's, wow. a lot, there's a lot of suspensions going on right now we're seeing. So typically there's a 14 day buffer. Right. And it's a rolling 14 days. Now, if you talk to a lot of sellers, they'll tell you that 14 days turns into 19 days very quickly. But what we're seeing yep. right now is due to suspensions and the way they the way rollover balances work. There's a lot of people pouring into e-commerce right now and they're not all genuine good people. You know, like the economy, we, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Right. And it's just to be completely honest, things are crazy. A lot of people have been losing their jobs and the one industry that is still working really well is e-commerce. So we're seeing a lot of people coming to e-commerce. Some of them are great, wonderful people and they're having great success. Others aren't, you know, we've all heard the stories of buying a laptop and getting a box of sand. And so <laughs> what's happening right now is Amazon is very nervous. You know, they want to yeah. make sure that for them, demand is everything. The consumer is everything, A to Z guarantee. And, they, and so what we're seeing right now is even things that might've been totally fine a year ago, like maybe like a misprint on a label or something very minor is now creating, you know, a suspension and it might be a suspension for four or five days. And then you go through a review process. But we've been hearing that that 14 days, it's actually been creeping up uh, longer than 14 days. 
Wow. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you mentioned that Amazon is very consumer centric. So we have a lot of clients, you know, when they come to seller app and then they're like, you know, we we have the same problem and we uh, message seller central and they haven't gotten back to us ever. And you have to raise like multiple case complaints to even get your um, case heard in the Amazon world. So, yes, I understand how frustrating that be, must must be. And even if they're doing it for minor things, um, your buffer period might, as Alex said, increase to up to 30 days even. So how does payability help sellers during those buffer periods to help the $10 uh, become more because they have to restock and get that back in the business? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, just quickly going on the math, you know, like, so if we're looking at, in that example, a 10 to 20% profit margin, and if our mm -hmm. PPC was 20 to $30, so it means our ACOS was 20 to 30%, it looks like we're probably spending too much on, on PPC in relation to what uh -huh. our margins are. And so like there mm -hmm. we want to actually, you know, and it, we can actually put that out. And then what we'd want to do is we'd want to refine that over time. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. what we want to do is we want to have access to that money to be able to reinvest into, into the inventory. Because in that equation, you know, the big thing that's happening here that we don't want to lose track of is I'm selling inventory. That means I need to restock yep. because Ideally, I want to keep doing this again and again. And so that's, you know, it's where we built our flagship product, Instant Access, was to solve this pain point of I'm selling, I have inventory that's moving, I don't have enough money right now to restock my inventory, and I need additional capital to be able to keep up with the demand. And that's where, um, that's why we invented Instant Access, which is essentially, you've already made the sale, we want to get you paid faster for it. We want to turn that net 14 into net one. And while we can't, if, if you are suspended, you know, we can't necessarily keep advancing you during the suspension, but at least you'll have gotten the money that you made up to that suspension. So if it does get rolled over, it won't be 30 days before you got paid. You'll have gotten paid right up into that suspension point. And then we do, you know, we can't work on suspensions directly, but we do have partners uh, that we recommend to our customers to be able to help with suspensions that have a good success rate. Um, but it's about being able to have that capital in your hands, you know, all the time. And we have the security. And we have customers who, like some of our biggest customers, we have customers as small as two thousand dollars a month in sales. We have customers as large as ten million a month in sales. And what oh, we've wow. seen with some of our biggest customers is they use us. I wouldn't call it an insurance because it's not an insurance policy, but more assurance, right? Because there they know that if they do get suspended, especially if they have five, 6,000 SKUs, they have a hundred people in a warehouse. Someone's going to put a label on wrong at some point. And then <laughs> they, where their suspension is going to happen is they'll probably get suspended from even putting it into FBA if they're using FBA, or they'll get a suspension. It'll probably only be two or three days, but we, we see some of our biggest customers use us just to make sure that if they do get suspended, they had their money up until the day they were suspended. And that way, three or four days of not being able to sell doesn't actually throw off their, their budgeting and their, you know, cash flow projections, um, you know, for the quarter or for the year. So again, it's, it's really, it's, you know, if you're making that 10 to $20, we want to get as much of that into your hands as fast as we can. So you can put that money back to work. And then our other product instant advance, if you're making good sales, what we can do there is, you know, instant access, that's getting you paid faster for the sale you already made instant advance. We're going to project what we think you're going to do next month in sales. We're going to give it to you in an upfront lump sum. So we see a lot of our customers use it for marketing to be able to drive more demand. And then we see a lot of our customers use it for inventory to say, I found something that's working. I've got a great discount. You know, I've got um, my vendors offering me a discount. If I can buy X amount, I need, I don't have the money. I'm, I'm you know, like I'm getting paid, you know, twice a month and sales are good, but I need some additional capital. And that's why we invented yeah. instant advance. It came organically from our customers asking us, you know, a couple times a year, I need to make a big purchase. Can you make us a <laughs> loan? And we said, well, we can't make you a loan because we're not a bank, but we could probably do something similar. And our instant advance works very similar to anyone who's used PayPal working capital or Shopify capital um, or Stripe capital. It's essentially a discounted future purchase of sales. So we're projecting what we think you're going to make in sales next month. We're giving it to you up front in a lump sum, and then we get paid uh, over time as you as you make the sales. Yep, and I think that's a security for you and for the seller. Plus, it's not as um, 
a blood sucking as a bank i would say i don't want to use such term but then i've seen banks to be very uh a uh, very you know aggressive in their loan policy so i'm glad that we have payability here to give assurance but not insurance to people all right so um this is a question that one of our sellers had so we have seen sellers whose roas has dropped even when they made no changes to the product or the campaign why do you think that happened and what do you suggest There could be a handful of reasons why that could happen. And it could be, you know, we'll start with one of the easiest that we want to look at is it might be seasonality. It's just you're st- you know, if you're selling bathing suits and it's now the middle yep. of February, you know, you <laughs> um, unless people are going on cruises which we know with the pandemic they aren't, you know, you could keep spending all that money on advertising, but if the demand isn't there, then that might be an issue. So we want to we would I would probably if we were going to analyze it I would start with demand. Is there still the same is there still the same demand for that product regardless of how much you're spending on advertising? You haven't changed anything but something's changing. So now we got to try to figure out what it is. And we want to put on, you know, our investigator hat and think about it critically. Is there still the same demand? How can I look into see what the demand is? Can I look at some competitors? You know, demand is a little tough to track but Is there still the same demand? Is the market oversaturated? Was there a lot of demand yeah. and now a ton of competitors piled in? And so there we can kind of, we might be able to glean some of that by like has the has the bidding gone up on the keywords and things like that, but you know, is demand there? Has there been too much demand and now it's oversaturated? <laughs> and then some other things I would want to look at is, you know, maybe if, if for some reason it's just not we're not getting the attributions we're looking for we're not getting the conversions we're looking for has our page gotten stale are we still using the right keywords what if we're call what if everyone's calling it something else now you know like it's it's tough when we sit on this end and we have to think about what consumers are trying or thinking about what if you know to go back to the bluetooth speaker what if now everyone's not searching for outdoor speaker they're searching for floating speaker do i have the keywords that are actually coming up with that so if we're doing everything exactly the same and we're seeing less you know bang for our dollar we're seeing less conversions we want to ask ourselves is there enough is there enough demand for it right now has the market become oversaturated do i need to actually change what i'm doing is what i'm doing stale maybe i need to actually update my things because people are going oh i've already seen this before oh i know who they are i'm not you know so there we want to we want to focus on the right keywords we want to maybe yep. it's time to optimize our page content maybe it's time to optimize our titles maybe it's you know time to reanalyze um our our what our bids are for this and so that's like the first step is again like not to over repeat myself but the first step is is there still demand <laughs> so number yeah one. it all boils down to the demands has the market been saturated you know and then if those things aren't if if everything still looks good there's a lot of demand there's not a lot of saturation then maybe it's time for us to update our stuff maybe the maybe what we're doing is a little stale maybe we're not you know maybe people are thinking about the product differently and we want to be on top of that you know there's um there's been this uh rumor around there that 65 or 75 or 80% i forget of all searches start on amazon and now i don't really buy into that personally <laughs> because i think when you go to amazon you already know what you're looking for you're typing in yep. a speaker you're typing in sneakers you're typing in paper towels that search for discovery that usually happens on something like it can happen on Instagram it can happen on Pinterest it can happen on Google but that's where you're using kind of your natural language type of search you're saying what's the best way to dry my hands what's the best way to listen to music outside and those type of searches don't actually start on Amazon so usually when that creating the ideas of like you know What's the you know um like what's the best tasting soda? Right? You're going to ask that question. Now, with Alexa, it'll be very interesting. Cuz now people are talking to Alexa <laughs> and they're using natural language and Amazon's very smart and they're going to be able to turn yeah. that into I think you're asking for soda flavors. But right now a lot of that discovery search still happens outside of Amazon. So you want to be able to think about where's the top of that funnel? how are people thinking about my product and you want to start to explore some of those areas too like things like Instagram or Pinterest or just Google and try to get an idea of how are people thinking about my product 
And then I would kind of bring that back into, if I'm not seeing the same conversions I was a week or two or a month ago, are people thinking about my product differently? And I would go above and beyond just Amazon to make sure I understand the consumer mindset of how they're thinking about my product. Then I would work that back into Amazon to be able to take advantage of that demand engine. No, that's very smart advice and that's the same advice we follow in seller app as well so when our customers are not uh you know are not able to look for the keywords we ask them to go back and talk to their relatives their friends and we take their product as well and we ask everyone how they will be searching for the product on amazon so once you get those searches there you go those are your keywords list them and then you'll see the changes right away so um, Alex has been uh, an accountant and in finance for over seven to 10 years, more than 10 years actually. So how does one not go broke on Amazon, Alex, and lighten us? So that is, that is the, the million dollar question. And I think what it is, is, you know, back, back earlier where we were talking about, about, you know, like starting out small. I think a lot of what we want to think about is we want to start, we, it de again, it depends on where you are in the journey. If we're just starting out, we want to start small. We want to make sure we're not getting in over our head. And we want to make sure that we have an understanding of what's happening. Because what we don't want to do in the, the horror stories we've heard is people have put their entire life savings into one product and that product doesn't sell. And, you know, what, what I would love to have been able to talk with that person and, you know, not hindsight is obviously 2020. But what I would love to be able to do is talk with that person before they make that purchase and go, have you ever sold anything online? No, do not do this. <laughs> do not spend your entire life savings on an individual product when you do, because whoever's selling you that product, whoever's telling you to make manufacture that product, you're their customer. They just care that you're able yep. to buy it. Now, ideally, if you have a great vendor, they care that you're able to buy from them for 10, 20 years. But we always want to remember that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably it is, is. probably is. <laughs> this is not a get rich quick scheme. And I think that's what a lot of people forget. It's a job like anything else. You have to put effort into it. So I think where a lot of people think is like, oh, I took this course. This person told me I'm going to be a millionaire. All I have to do is buy their product and sell it. Nope. It is like anything else. If you put in the time, you put in the effort and you work it like a job, you will be profitable. It doesn't happen overnight. It may, it, look, lightning lightning in a bottle can happen, but the truth is the way that we've seen people be very successful is they take incremental steps up and up and up. They do a little more tomorrow than they did today, and they do a little more the day after that, and a little more, they refine, they improve, they refine, and they improve. So when it comes to like, how do you do it without going broke? You do it sensibly like anything else. You don't buy the million dollar mansion when you're 18 years old and just started in college. You rent an apartment or you live in a dorm. You don't buy the, the Ferrari when you don't have the money for it. You buy something that's gonna get you to work. And then over time, you, you kind of improve upon it. The, the same exact thing, and it, it, I, I don't care if it's a billion dollar company or you know a small business that's you know doing about 50,000 a year. If you just take things incrementally and you don't try to get to the moon in one shot and you, you shoot for the moon, but you work at getting there and that'll make you take bite-sized pieces. And what I usually tell everyone is you take bite-sized pieces until you finish the meal. Don't try to eat the whole thing mm -hmm. at one time because that's when you get, a, you, know, you get over your skis, you get ahead of yourself. And then it's also, it creates anxiety. If we're taking yep. the right steps and we're building a real business and we're learning, we can do it calmly. We can actually think about things and we don't have to, anxiety is one of the worst things that can happen to a business owner. It happens all the time. And we need anxiety, right? Because anxiety is what keeps us alive as humans and what, it's what tells us there's danger out there. But what we don't yeah. wanna create is an environment that's so stressful that you become into a state of paralysis because you're so nervous about being over leveraged. You're so nervous about having tied up all your money into one thing that you can't actually even make a decision anymore. And that comes from getting ahead of ourselves. And that usually comes from, you know, frankly, listening to someone else who tells you, oh, it's easy. Oh, all you have to do is this. Nothing in life is like that. You got to put in the work. So what I would recommend to everyone is it can be very successful if you put in the work, but no, you're going to have to put in the work. 
And those first three months are going to be super fun, very challenging, but a lot of work because you're going to be doing a lot of learning, figuring out what your products are, figuring out how the systems work. And you don't want to, you know, it depends. Are, are you starting it as a side hustle where you already have a, a full-time job? Are you diving into it head first? You know, you want to make sure that you are know why you're doing it. You know, and like, I think a lot of people, most people don't make business plans anymore. And a lot of people don't make mission statements anymore. And I think that they're both mm -hmm. really valuable. You know, having a mission statement, even just for yourself, whether you make it public or not, what are you looking to achieve? Is this something that you want to, do you want to give something back? Do you want to be a sustainable business? Are you just trying to make a lot of money? They're all okay, but you should know what you're looking to do. If you just want to make a ton of money and become the next internet millionaire, great, awesome. But know it and be honest with yourself about what you're trying to achieve because once you know what your individual mission is, now we can create a business plan. And it doesn't have to be a business plan that we bring to a bank. It can just be something for ourselves. It can be a couple pages, but there we want to line out, here's what I'm trying to achieve. Here's my mission. Here are the steps I need to do it. And it's going to be simple things of like, what do I think my addressable market is? What do I think the products that I'm going to be able to sell to get into that addressable market are? How many of those different types of products do I need to be able to, you know, actually have conversions? Am I trying to do just one product? If so, how much do I know about that product? Who else is on my team to be able to help me? If it's just myself, that's okay yeah. too. If a spouse is going to help or a friend is going to help or you have a co-founder, like who's going to do what? Who has the expertise of what? And I'm not saying you have to necessarily break down resumes, but like, Having a resume is not bad either. Like where are the, because when you know what your strengths are and you know where your limitations are, now we can fill, we can use our strengths and fill those limitations with other people or work on ourselves to be able to get those limitations. So taking kind of like a traditional starting a business mindset, have a mission. It doesn't have to be, you know, whether it's altruistic or not, you know, your mission doesn't have to be to save the world. Your mission can be, I want to make enough money to buy a house. I want to make enough money to quit my job. Great. That's the goal. That's the mission. How are we going to get there? Laying out a, a type of business plan is part of that. And then the budget. A budget's a big part of business plan. How much money do you have right now? How much money do you think you can get? Whether it's an investor, whether it's a rich uncle, whether it's your credit cards, <laughs> whether it's working with companies like Payability, how much money do you think you'll be able to access? How much time period are you giving yourself? before you can decide whether or not you've had success. And what is your, like your burn rate? What does your cash flow burn rate look like? How much money are you gonna burn before you actually start to see revenue? How much revenue do you need to be able to be sustainable? And are you actually, is it realistic? And I think that's the hard question that we all have to ask ourselves when we start any type of new business. I've now laid it all out. It's gonna be, let's <laughs> yep. say 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, <laughs> this much money. I'm trying to achieve this. Is it worth it? Do I think that I can stick to it for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 20 years? Like, and understanding that horizon of, as a, as a former founder myself, I've had businesses that have done well, I've had businesses that haven't. And knowing when is your time frame of when you can call it quits if it's not working, that's one of the hardest things to do and it's one of the most important because you can take on hundreds of ventures in your life if you know how to walk away when they're not working. If you don't know how to walk away when it's not working, it, you know, like you might have so much just heartache from one business, you never try it again. So I'm not trying to go into the negative, but I think we always need to be honest with ourselves anytime we start a new venture, that it might be the biggest success in the world and it might not. Both are okay, as long as we're being honest with ourselves, we're looking at the information we're getting back. We try to pivot when we need to, but we don't, bang our head against the wall on something that's not working either. If we can fix it, great. If we can't fix it, maybe we need to rethink the whole thing. Go back to the mission statement. What was the mission? If the mission was just to make money, maybe the mission needs to be improved upon for us to be able to get to the ultimate goal of just making money. And yeah, the long circuitous way of ho hopefully answering <laughs> the question. No, it's like A to Z guide on how not to get broke. And it was great. Yeah, so um, I have seen a lot of sellers when they start on Amazon, sometimes they grow so quickly and it gets to their head. You know what? They're like, oh yeah, now that I'm getting this much money, I will get it next month, then month after. But that does not happen all the time. So make sure that you have a fund 
uh, and make sure that you also are spending wisely. So if you're reinvesting in your business rather than spending it all out at once, maybe try to um, understand that your product might not do as well as it did in this month. So that caution, that understanding, and as uh, Alex said, to have a mission goal, not to become a billionaire, but a smaller achievable mission, um, milestones or a mission goal will help you um, be become profitable in, on Amazon consistently, uh, if not, you know, all at once. So yes, thank you, Alex. This was such a great session. I had such a good time and um, do check out our seller apps free tools. Do check out Payplity if you want any cash advance or capital advance on your business. And if you do not want to wait for the Buffy period as well and um, like this video, subscribe to our channel and I will see you on Monday. Bye bye.